You might wonder why I picked this topic, uh, integrating rationality and spiritedness to correct a misleading, di a misleading dichotomy to this audience. The answer is that I was told that you all would be non-economics students at Francisco Marroquin. And so I thought that among my recent works, this would be something that would say, perhaps how much you had missed, uh, or perhaps not, because there's a misperception of economics as being wedded to pure rationality and taking other things out of consideration. And I wanted to lay out the idea that the <laughs> entire range of human emotions are very as are as much a part of economics as a field as is traditional rationality. <clears throat> For the most part, economics as a discipline treats individuals as duplicates of one another. One another. That's really a feature of the kinds of modeling techniques that economists have used. That, that is the traditional focus of economists lie on various aggregate variables, income, rates of growth, rates of poverty, distribution of wealth, questions like that. It's been often claimed by critics of free market style economics that free markets, the case that economists make for free market forms of social organization overstate the ability of the free market form to serve human needs because those ideas are based on the ubiquity of rationality in human conduct. And once you bring in the prevalence of animal spirits, they're called, that this ubiquity doesn't hold, that maybe free markets work well or would work well if people were universally, rationally calculating creatures. But once you allow those creatures to be responsive to the animal spirits they feel, all those claims about the bene beneficial feature of market processes recedes. <clears throat> this idea, this claim was made by John Maynard Keynes in 1936 in his general uh, theory, and which was a book that began the contemporary uh, version of macroeconomics <clears throat> that is with us today. And it's a style, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a style of economics that then claims that market kinds of processes are filled with examples of failures of markets to work like the economists typically suggest they do work. Now I want, <clears throat> like today, to take a deeper dive 
into the world of animal spirits. So what I'm doing in this presentation on which this paper is based is trying to develop a different presentation of free market style economics, one that integrates the rational calculation idea and the animal spirit idea. As far as the rational calculation idea, I would wonder how many of you perhaps have <clears throat> looked into the problems of rational calculation. There is a idea out there called undecidability. <clears throat> Undecide there are many, many questions that are undecidability by the standards of rational calculation. <clears throat> how can something be undecidable? I don't know how many of you might have taken <clears throat> a course in decision theory. Uh, <clears throat> the basic ideas of decision theory are pretty simple. You might imagine a situation where perhaps your parents are holding your wedding reception. Can you get your head around that? Your parents are going to hold a wedding reception for you, and they have a decision as to where to hold that reception. They can have it indoors or outdoors. This is a very typical decision problem that appears in textbooks on decision theory. So the parent, your parents can hold the reception indoors or out. <clears throat> indoors won't be as exciting and interesting as outdoors if the weather is nice. But if the weather is not, whether it be very hot or very cold or very wet, under those circumstances, you wouldn't want, no one would want an outdoor reception. But the problem is, and it's a problem with all decisions, is that every decision, every choice, has to be made before you know what the circumstances are going to be. This is a fact of life, that decision involves some bridging of time. Every decision entails a situation where you as the decision maker, here you are right now, you have to make a decision. Now, how that decision will work out for you, you're not going to know right now. You can't know because the circumstance hasn't happened. This is a fact of almost all human life, that we have to decide things without knowledge, that is relevant to the choice we would make. Your parents, in this case, are going to have to decide, and they issue the invitations and make the arrangements, they're going to have to decide whether to hold that wedding reception outside or inside. And maybe it'll, two weeks later, they can have weather figures on probabilities of rain at different seasons. Take those from tables, they're all available. 
but that that isn't sufficient information to tell what things will be like in two weeks. There, those are just figures on past cases of how much rain you had on the 10th of August, say, the 25th of September, and things like that. But just because for the past 30 September 25ths, it has only rained twice, is no guarantee that it'll be dry on the September 25th of your wedding. It may be a hugely wet day. So how do your parents go forward? Because there, there are arrangements to be made. How does anyone go forward with a decision? Because all you can do is take, as it were, a leap of faith. You have, that is the fundamental feature of all human action, is the choices we make, the decisions we take, are taken with some degree of belief about how that choice will work out. But we have no assurance about how it will work out because there is no way that we can know the future and its conditions before the future comes. And that is just a fundamental fact of life. So then how do people live in this environment where if you go to the textbook, you say, well, estimate how much utility you would get from an indoor reception. Second, Estimate the utility you would get from an outdoor reception. The outdoor reception gives you two times the utility of the indoor reception. Then go to your weather report, look up the probability of rain on the day of the wedding, and Take that probability and estimate the discounted utility of an indoor versus an outdoor reception with rain and without rain. And there you have it. Having done that calculation, it can't make you feel any better though because it's not going to tell you if it's going to be raining on September 25th or not. And so, disappointment is always in the cards. That's a fact of life, too. What is the point of this example? It says that we have developed various kinds of models of decision-making that go about calculating expected utilities under different circumstances. Those circumstances all entail making what-if presuppositions. What if it rains the day of my wedding? What if it doesn't rain? And then make a calculation based upon that. But then if you think about it further, is that satisfactory? It doesn't, I haven't said anything about whether it's going to, September 25th is going to see a very light drizzle between the hours of nine and 10 in the morning. 
or whether it's going to see a torrential downpour almost all of the day. Those are more detailed levels of knowledge than uh, the simple, will it rain or won't it rain? If you bring in considerations of heavy rain, light rain, mists, so forth, uh, you're suddenly, you suddenly find yourself in a fairly complex world that fits in with the idea of undecidability. There are all kinds of choices that you have already faced and will face even more as you move along in your lives where what you face are situations that cannot be reasonably portrayed in terms of simple models of decision theory. But yet decisions you must make and there you are. <clears throat> so what, how would you characterize your going forward into this dark new world of undecidability? I would suggest it's animal spirits. And what are the states of your animal spirits? What do I mean by animal spirits? Well, what I mean by animal spirits is probably not what followers of John Maynard Keynes meant by animal spirits. What Keynes and his followers meant by animal spirits was anything that eroded belief in rationality as a key to efficient human action because of a presumption that the, the efficient features of market action depended upon the ability to calculate efficient answers. <clears throat> the presence of undecidability means efficient answers aren't calculable and yet actions are taken. But the taking of those actions suggests animal spirits must be present. Now, animal spirits and canes, there's a history in economics going back to 1936 where to invoke the term animal spirits is to deny rational human conduct, which has been thought by critics to undermine uh, the basic liberal style values of freedom in the world. Not so though. Animal spirits, to what might animal spirits really refer? This concept does it not stir up the image of wild cats fighting over a monkey or some sort of thing like that? You probably all have seen, I know I've watched them, of some of these style of YouTubes of someone in Africa uh, finding a, a pride of lions or something, taking on a hippopotamus or stuff like that, uh, and what the level of their animal spirits might be. But I would suggest animal spirits are wrongly implicated in the idea of irrationality that uh, to set a wedding date you have to be irrational because you can't truly calculate uh, the necessary utilities. No, that's not it at all. Animal spirits 
are, <coughs> excuse me, are rather bound up in recognition that life is something that has to be faced. Think back again that all human action, animal spirits are necessary to live, to thrive in a world where all decisions are going to place you as the decision maker in a situation where you have to commit yourself right now, sometimes in a small way, like what to buy in a store, sometimes in a major way of wedding dates, car purchases, whatever, but you have to commit yourself now. That's just the nature of choice and its relation to the passing of time. The passing of time, of course, is something that most economists ignore, which is a problem for most economists. But it means in any case that there is no calculation that can return answers to the question, what must I do? There is no such thing. There can be such a thing in the imagination. A writer of a decision theory textbook can concoct examples that show those calculations being made. But if you look into those textbooks and read them carefully, you'll see that what the author of the textbook is doing is imposing a situation where there is a choice to be made, there are presumptions made about the payoffs to different choices, along with then presumed data about the probabilities that feed into the expected values of different choices. But those illustrative calculations don't get involved with the complexity of bringing in such things as, well, the world is more complex than just a textbook example of rain or shine. Uh, there's all kinds of levels of rain, and there are various times of day when that rain uh, can occur. And once you start working with, you get out of a world where there are two options and possibilities that makes, for which expected value calculations are simple, into a world where <clears throat> there are a hundred different possibilities of which a successful, or an actual, excuse me, an actual wedding must choose five among those 100 possibilities. You're gonna then be in a world, if you do the combinatorial arithmetic, will amount to thousands and thousands of possible ways the wedding might turn out and the calculation might be made. And in many cases, there won't be enough time while you're still living to evaluate all those, in some cases, billions and billions of possibilities. So where that leads me and what I want to suggest to you is that 
The world of feeling, of emotion, of affective sympathies and sentiments are as fully involved in the world of commercial action as is the calculation of benefits and costs and all of that. And that it's been a misguided adventure of most economists over the last century or so to say that economic theory, market theory, comes into play when we focus on people as rational creatures and thereby environments that are subject to rational calculation. And I'm here then to suggest in this line of work that there is really no such thing as an environment where rational calculation is all there is. Because problems of undecidability are ubiquitous in the worlds in which we live. And so, if spiritedness and rationality both fit into and have places within a good free economic order, I think it is necessary to wrestle with both. Ludwig von Mises uh, made a great use of the concept of timology, which goes back to the ancient Greeks. And that was a notion of spiritedness. And I would suggest that perhaps one of the worst things of the uh, really massive growth and presence of government and the political processes in societies has been to re has been to replace spiritedness with calculation. If you think in terms of governmental programs in various ways are offering promises of specific benefits for specific taxes. The basic idea of a market economy, going back to Frank Knight's risk, uncertainty, and profit, is just what I've said in terms of decision theory, that businesses have to make their commercial choices without truly knowing how those choices are going to turn out. They can have an image, they can have a belief, but you can never have knowledge before it's time. And so a well-working market economy, liberal society, <clears throat> requires a world in which people, the citizenry, are willing to go forward, continually acting, not knowing the consequences of actions, and freedom and its success in life very much depends on that. And so with that, I would uh, draw this to a close and say that the real virtue of freedom, liberty, as forms of social organization and social order are that the practice of freedom is different from a world in which the world is governed by a sense of entitlement because entitlement 
can only um, be entitlements can only be offered through some authority that doesn't have to earn their way in the society. And so that that becomes a different world. And I guess what I'm calling upon then is for economists and students of economics and of society in general to recognize and to think about how it is that the good features of living together in free societies is, is served by the participation of a population that is eager to move into life, to embrace its various adventures and challenges without being able to calculate the outcomes of your actions today, those out, because those outcomes won't be experienced today, they will be experienced in the future. And so there is a significant difference between making choices where a guarantee is offered to you today for having made that choice, which is a world of entitlement, and making choices today where the outcome of that choice is as it must be determined when the various future circumstances come together. And that's a feature of the very simple proposition that all choices, all actions, entail the creation of bridges over time. You may recall a popular song, of course, it was before your times, but it was a song titled something like A Bridge Over Troubled Water. And so you can have, uh, you can imagine a bridge over troubled water, but you can also, it's not quite apt to refer to a bridge over time as against uh, a bridge of time, but that's all choices are meaning the fundamental character of every single choice is you commit yourself at this instant, not truly knowing what you're going to get from that act of commitment. That's it. That's the way it has to be. You commit yourself at this instant based on an image that you have formed about how you think that commitment will work out but that commitment hasn't worked out now, it can't. It has sufficient time has to have passed to allow all of the actions and activities uh, necessary for a working out of that commitment. And I think contemporary economic theory has done great disservice to uh, these kinds of issues about choice, decision, commitment, time, and so forth. And if these issues were rethought, the so-called discrepancy between the rational calculation of value and the irrational spiritedness of animal spirits would disappear. It would be recognized to have been 
an illusory distinction based upon false and erroneous ideas about human societies and economic activity. And I th thank you for your attention. Thank you.